What's going on guys? Alex here and I'd like to welcome you to yet another Efros Financial Power Hour live stream. It's a beautiful thing. Get on your favorite couch, get a cup of coffee ready, get comfortable with your significant other because we're going to cover some financial planning, tax, investment questions. It's going to be a good time. Now, as discussed last time, we're always upgrading, taking things to the next level for you guys. And with that, we have the ability for you guys to actually call in and interact with crazy old me. That's right. If you have questions, you have a comment, you want to add something to the discourse, well, I welcome that. And what could be better for a call-in than a beautiful overlay? Look how fancy that is, okay? Only the best for you guys. So, if you want to call in, the number's on the screen. Make sure that you have something to add to the conversation that you don't use a blocked number. So we have to be able to see the caller ID. That's pretty much the only rule. We're not going to broadcast it on the stream, but it just makes sure that the quality of the conversation is going to be at the highest. All right. So feel free to call in. That number is going to be on the screen throughout the live stream. So there's going to be some interaction. So it's not just me pontificating to a camera. Sound good? All right. With that. We're going to get straight to the first Reddit question of the day, which is from the entrepreneur subreddit. And it goes as follows. My company makes 30000 annually, and I want to write off a $50,000 vehicle. How does that sound? All right, let's take a look. I've been debating if I should get an SUV under 6,000 pounds, that's a key number we're going to come back to in a little bit, under my personal name for my business to help move inventory around, but I'm not sure if I'm going overboard on the vehicle's price, being that it's going to be, we're going to find out the number later, okay, but keep that in mind. I heard we can use vehicle tax deduction methods to help pay for our vehicle within five years. I'm planning to keep this vehicle for at least 10 years. It will be used 80 plus percent for business. And sometimes for personal use, like my family travels or for vacations. We do have a good second vehicle available for personal driving. All right. My question is, am I shooting too high in a $50,000 vehicle that is more than my average annual profit of $30,000? Which tax deduction method should I use if I travel about 10,000 miles a year doing business? Is vehicle depreciation a different tax deduction? If the vehicle gets 20% deduction a year and I don't use the full deduction amount, does it roll over to the following years of the business or do I lose that deduction for the year? All good questions. And I feel like this person has already done some research because they're hitting on some key points, all right? When us accountants hear depreciation questions, there are factors that pop up into our mind, such as what is the percentage of business use? Is there another vehicle available for personal use? What kind of business entity is it? Is it a corporation? Is it a sole proprietorship, etc.? And are there going to be records for the use of the vehicle? Okay, so this person hit on a lot of those different factors in this question. All right, specifically the 6,000 pound gorilla in the room, if you will. All right, so let's take a look at this. We have a few variables that we need to take into account. One is that the vehicle is 50,000. The other is that the average annual profit is 30,000. When we talk about depreciation, one of the main factors is whether that deduction is allowable from an income tax perspective, right? And one of the limitations that we have to deal with when we're talking about vehicles is, is it lavish or extravagant? Okay, because if this person was making 30,000 annually and they try to buy a Lambo and take the depreciation on that, the question is for this type of business, is that an ordinary and necessary business expense or is it lavish and extravagant, which would mean that it may not be deductible or some portion of it may be deductible, but the majority of the cost would not be. So that's one consideration. Is it lavish or extravagant? And you have to look at the facts and circumstances and make a determination. As a professional, you have to weigh the cost of the vehicle versus the amount of income and profit for the business and make a decision. In this case, I don't think that $50,000 vehicle is necessarily lavish and or extravagant in this case. Okay, so we've passed that hurdle. And we have to think about this in terms of 
how is the depreciation going to work? Because we know that there's section 179, right? It's one way to accelerate depreciation. In many cases, you could purchase and place in service an asset for, let's say, a million dollars in a particular year and write it all off. Now, does that apply? We'll have to see. On the other hand, if we have bonus depreciation, that's yet another form of accelerated depreciation. Is that something that we can take into account? in terms of reducing the net income from the business. And on top of that, we have maker's depreciation, right? So how does that work when all of this is taken into account? Now, when we're talking about vehicles, there's essentially a fork in the road that we have to consider, okay? It can go one of two ways. And really, that has to do with the 6,000 pound limit that was discussed in the question. And what does that mean? Well, when the IRS or really Congress, but especially the IRS, when they look at this, they want to know that you're not taking the family vehicle and calling it a business vehicle and getting tax benefits that you really shouldn't get. So when it comes to passenger automobiles, which we'll look at the definition in a second, but when it comes to passenger automobiles as opposed to work trucks, work vans, ambulances, things of that nature, Congress is particularly sensitive because they don't want every taxpayer out there to be deducting their vehicle expenses all willy-nilly, okay? They, they have to get controls over this because when uh, the cat's away, the mice will play, and automobile deductions are in a special area of, let's say, malfeasance, all right? So let's take a look at how all of this works when we're talking about vehicles. Let's keep in mind the 6,000-pound threshold the fact that the vehicle is $50,000 in terms of the cost and the fact that the average annual net profit of the business is 30,000. So those are the key points that we're gonna take into account and we're gonna look at good old publication 946. I love publication 946. If you don't like this publication, you're crazy. So we're gonna take a look at a particular section here that has to do with passenger automobiles. All right, so let's see what it says. A passenger automobile is any four-wheeled vehicle made primarily for you two different technical measurements and you'd have to look this up for your particular vehicle but this is where that six thousand pound threshold comes into place and comes into play and you could see that this person already mentioned that six thousand pound threshold that's why okay because we need to be clear if we're above six thousand pounds or below six thousand pounds if we're below then we're in passenger automobile territory and these rules that we're going to cover now are applicable all right so the following vehicles are not considered passenger automobiles all right so an ambulance hearse or combination ambulance hearse <laughs> i've never seen one of those used directly in a trade or business you know if i hear a siren coming towards my house i want to know if it's an ambulance or a hearse personally all right i don't want a combo <laughs> both vehicles in one you could keep that twofer in the garage send the ambulance or send the hearse one or the other not a combo please aside from that a vehicle used directly in the trade or business of transporting persons or property for pay or hire so for example a taxi cab or a school bus all right and a truck or van that is qualified not personal use vehicle a lot of definitions basically what congress does not want is for the personal vehicle to create a outsized tax deduction all right so nobody's going to the club in an ambulance no one's going to the club in a hearse or in a work truck so the potential for personal use in that regard tends to be lower all right so in that case they're separating out vehicles that you're very likely to use for personal purposes being the passenger automobiles under six thousand pounds from the vehicles that you're probably not going to use for personal purposes for example if it's one of those vehicles with a crane on top you're probably not going to visit your grandmother with it right because it gets two miles to the gallon all right so we can look here to see other property used for transportation although vehicles used to transport persons or property for pay or hire rated at more than the 6,000 pound threshold are not passenger automobiles, okay? So in this case, if you get an SUV over 6,000 pounds or if you get one of the Teslas that are out there that happens to be over 6,000 pounds, then the limits pertaining to depreciation that apply to passenger automobiles are not applicable. We're gonna cover them in a second. 
but you still need to maintain records, okay? So it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to maintain accurate records for income tax purposes to justify any deductions that you happen to take. So that's where that's outlined. All right. Here we have a list of accepted vehicles, all right? So clearly marked police and fire vehicles, unmarked vehicles used by law enforcement officers, combines, cranes, derricks, forklifts, things like that, okay? So very small chance of personal use. In that case, the IRS says, look, even if it's under 6,000 pounds, it's clearly not a passenger automobile. So the rules for passenger automobiles that we'll cover, we're getting there, do not apply for those accepted vehicles. All right. So when we talk about passenger automobiles, I keep harping on this definition. Who cares, right? Well, it matters because the maximum depreciation deduction for passenger automobiles, including trucks and vans, is something that pertains to our original question. How much depreciation can you take? Can you write off the whole 50 grand in our example in the first year? Do you have to space it out? What's the depreciation going to look like? What about section 179? What about bonus depreciation? Well, all of those questions are answered on this handy dandy table, which says that if you have a certain year that the property is placed in service, let's say 2021, here are the depreciation limitations for each year. So what's happening is Congress is saying, look, we don't want you going crazy with depreciation in any particular year. So we're going to force you to space it out over time, even not taking into account bonus depreciation, section 179. We're not going to let you go crazy with this. You can try to take advantage of all the accelerated depreciation programs that you want. But at the end of the day, you're still going to be limited to the numbers on this page. So in the first year, you're only going to get 18,200. But let's look at the stipulation. We see a little one here. If you elect not to claim any bonus depreciation, I made a whole video on bonus depreciation. You can elect out of it, okay? Or the vehicle is not qualified property with regard to bonus depreciation, the maximum deduction is 10,200. So instead of 18,200, if you elect out of bonus depreciation or special depreciation allowance, they're synonymous, the limitation drops to 10,200. That's including makers, including section 179. You cannot exceed that level of depreciation for a passenger automobile in any particular tax year okay so again congress doesn't want everybody deducting their vehicles all willy-nilly so these were some limitations put in place to try to curb abuse in this area there are real deductions that are available here but tax spares tend to get a little bit cloudy in terms of what's business use what's personal use and you'll have vehicles that have 138 per percent uh, business use we all know how that turns out so in the first year, the limitation is 18,200. In the second year, it's 16,400. And why is there no number here? Why isn't it telling us that, hey, by the way, in the second year, bonus depreciation may or may not change that amount? Well, bonus depreciation only applies in the first year in which the asset is placed into service. Okay, so in the second year, third year, and fourth year, et cetera, bonus depreciation isn't a factor at all. You still might have the maker's depreciation that you calculate and then you basically take the higher of or the lower of rather the limitation or the maker's depreciation but that's why you're seeing these numbers on the first year and not the subsequent years so in the second year you're limited to 16,400 third year 9,800 and fourth and later years 5,860 so you could see this $50,000 vehicle that's under 6,000 pounds as we could see from the question is going to be subject to these passenger automobile depreciation limitations. So let's take a look at an example because these publications are great in that they give you a feel of how this may play out. All right, so here we have an example. All right, on April 15th, 2021, the tax due date for 2020, Virginia Hart bought and placed in service a new car for 14500 she used the car only in her business, so business use, 100%. She files her tax return based on the calendar year. She does not elect the Section 179 deduction and elected not to claim any bonus depreciation allowance, okay? So no accelerated depreciation, just makers in this case. 
which is perfectly acceptable. Some taxpayers choose to accelerate depreciation, some don't. Under Makers, a car is five-year property. Since she placed her car in service on April 15th and only used it for business, she uses the percentages in table A1. We're not going to look at it for now to figure her Makers depreciation. Virginia multiplies the 14500 unadjusted basis of her car by 0 0.20, which is from the table, to get her Makers depreciation of 29 hundred for 2021 but here's the key the 2900 is below the maximum depreciation deduction of 10200 let's remember the table right so we're assuming no special depreciation allowance so 10200 and since the 2900 is below that amount you can deduct 2900 right so it's the lower of the maker's depreciation whatever depreciation you calculate or the limitation you can't use bonus depreciation section 179 to exceed these maximum thresholds for a passenger vehicle now if you have a vehicle that exceeds that 6000 pound limitation there are also some a few other stipulations you could bonus depreciation that vehicle 100% in year 1 so in this case, instead of having to space it out over time, you'd be able to essentially write off 50,000 against the 30,000 profit in a particular year. Now, what would happen then? I know you guys watching are smart and astute. Drop it in the comments below. What do you think would happen if you had 30,000 net profit from your business? Let's say this is a self-employed individual. We're assuming this is self-employment or single member LLC, something like that, not a corporation or a partnership. And if you take $50,000 in bonus depreciation on a vehicle that exceeds 6,000 pounds, well, in that case, you would create a net loss of $20,000, which is essentially the 30,000 profit, okay, minus the 50,000 bonus depreciation. And bonus depreciation is special in that it does allow you to create a net loss. So if this taxpayer has wages, interest, dividends, capital gains, any other taxable event in the year this loss in many cases if it's a bona fide trader business will allow them to offset the tax on those items so huge tax benefit and it's all available up front what's the stipulation that the vehicle is over six thousand pounds okay there's some other requirements there but that is a key number to keep in mind when you're talking about vehicle depreciation now if it's under the six thousand pounds you're more than likely talking about a passenger automobile and your depreciation is going to be severely limited all right if you guys are finding value in this drop a like in the comments below drop a comment and likes below and look you don't have to hit the like button okay some of you guys are pacifists you're you're non-violent that's fine gently caress the like button all right okay so let's see if we addressed all the questions that are in this post all right, which tax deduction should I use if I travel about 10,000 miles a year doing business? We already covered that. So we know that essentially, even with bonus depreciation and section 179, we have those limitations in place. We can't bonus it all in one year and take the 50,000. It's gonna be spaced out as indicated in this table. All right, is vehicle depreciation a different tax deduction? Vehicle depreciation would be stated on the depreciation line of let's say schedule c so if you have good old schedule c let's take a look i love schedule c it's a beautiful thing and here you have depreciation and section 179 expense deduction that's where you would deduct the vehicle now you might have other depreciation for other assets on that line as well so it'll be part of it but that's why having a depreciation schedule is helpful so you can see the individual line items broken out you're not going to have each asset listed here on schedule c it's all going to be combined into one depreciation line for all of the assets all right now another aspect to this is mileage logs okay i can't stress this enough mileage logs i'm going to say it again mileage logs say it with me mileage logs one time i had a prospective client call in and he was asking if we would take him on as a client for tax preparation 
And as always, we reviewed the last two years of filed income tax returns. So we had the one from two years prior and we had the one that was filed for the prior year. So let's call it tax year one, tax year two, okay? And in tax year one, I saw that this individual purchased a vehicle for, if I remember correctly, $80,000. It was over 6,000 pounds in terms of the gross vehicle weight. So they deducted everything, bonus depreciation right up front, 80 grand. Okay. And looking at the rest of the tax return, I saw that the mileage for the year was about 13,000 miles for business purposes. There was very little, if no personal mileage. So you have this vehicle mostly for business, no personal, 13,000 miles for business looking at the income for the business for that year, it was something like $70. Not 70,000, not 7.2 million, no, 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 $70. Okay, so I thought that's weird, but let me take a look at the following year. So this is year two. In this year, we had the carryover losses from the year in which this person took bonus depreciation. So again, the net income is negative. It's a net operating loss for the year, so they're paying no tax. And again, I look at the vehicle mileage, 15,000 miles, all business. There may be some personal miles here and there, maybe you know, double digit number, but pretty much all business. I look at the revenue for the business, $200. Now, I'm not a business pro by any means. I'm no business magnate. But if you're driving a total of about 30,000 miles over two years, wouldn't you expect to make over $300 for this business, especially if you took an $80,000 write-off? It's painful because you want to help these people, but at the same time, your hands are tied. They already screwed themselves. So you got to be careful with this depreciation stuff. And... When I asked this person if they had mileage or records, of course, I get what I always get when I ask taxpayers this question, silence, all right? We don't meet clients in person, so I never get to see the face they make, but I'm pretty sure they're dumbfounded by the question because they don't understand what a mileage log consists of, all right? So let's actually take a look at that because this is crucial. You have to keep a mileage log if you're going to deduct business mileage. Why? Because even if your vehicle is used for the business exclusively, let's say an IRS agent poking around says, you know what, I don't believe that you use it only for business. Show me the mileage log. And guess what? You become guilty until proven innocent because of the substantiation rules that exist for vehicles. So let's see if we can find a quick template of an IRS mileage log. And you have to maintain this. This is not optional. All right. And so many people get sideways when it comes to maintaining this and their deductions can simply go away. All right. Very simple. All right. Let's pull up this picture here and you guys can see what a mileage log might consist of. All right. Let's save this image. Let's pull this up. All right. So you can see here. All right, choosing not to cooperate with me just for a second, but we're going to make it work. All righty, so in this mileage log, you see that you have the date, you have the destination, you have the business purpose, you have the start and stop odometer readings at the beginning and the end of the trip, you have the miles for the trip, and you have any associated expenses, meaning the type and amount. Now, I know this is a little blurry, guys. I just grabbed this picture off the web really fast, but... This is the information that you need, all right, for every trip. I can't tell you how many taxpayers lose their deduction because they don't have this squared away. I'll say it again, mileage logs. If you're going to deduct business expenses related to the vehicle, you got to have this. It's not a choice. Now, business owners will often push back and say, look, Alex, I'm not going to track every trip. I got better things to do. I'm a photographer. I'm an engineer. I'm a contractor. I don't have time to pay attention to this stuff. Great. Very simple solution to that. There's an app called Mile IQ. This isn't an ad. I'm not associated with them in any way. I don't get any revenue. I don't have any coupon codes. I'm just sharing what works. And 
you get the app, you install it on your phone, and it'll kind of creepy, but it'll track everywhere you go, right? So you're doing your business, you're going to location A, B, C, D. At the end of the day, it'll very much like a dating app, make you swipe left on a personal trip or swipe right on a business trip. Could be the other way around. But the point is very simple swiping mechanism and all this information is already recorded because your phone has the GPS in there and it can't be simpler than that. At the end of the year, you download your full log and you can submit that to your accountant, all right? It keeps track of the date, the destination, business purpose, all that good stuff. And you can even add notes to it so you can remember down the line. Because if you read enough tax court cases, you'll know that the IRS has been so petty as to disallow vehicle deductions even when they got the log of the mileage. Why? Because they check the mileage log and try to agree it to the taxpayer's calendar and the entries didn't agree. So, whereas on the mileage log, they said, oh, I was at client A on July 21st. Oh, really? Well, your calendar didn't say that. It says something different. Deduction disallowed. All right? So, if you guys get anything out of today, if you're going to deduct vehicle mileage, I don't care if it's 100%, get the log. All right? Because if anybody questions it, you're guilty until proven innocent. Be in a good position. Track the mileage and you could submit it and sleep at night. Okay? So, and it's not an expensive app, it's a few dollars a month, worth its weight in gold. All right, so that is that with regard to vehicle expenses. Now, if the vehicle gets a 20% tax deduction and I don't use the full amount, does it roll over to the following years of the business? So essentially, whatever amount you get to deduct on, let's say, Schedule C, that will contribute to what the net income happens to be, right? So you have the net income or loss right here. And depending on your other income, depending on whether overall you have a net operating loss, then in many cases you can carry the loss either backward or forward. The rules have become very complex in this area. So in general, you do not lose the deductions. They may carry back or carry forward depending on the type of business entity, the tax year and so forth, uh, whether you filed your return timely, there are a number of considerations. That's a very complex question to answer, but in many cases, you don't just simply lose it. It can be carried over either back or forwards. All right, we've beaten this question up pretty well. If you guys are hanging out watching, drop a like, drop a comment down below. I see that we've got some comments happening over here. Now, is the Hummer deduction over 6,000 pounds. We've got a question here from Catherine. Thank you for your question. Let's make it nice and big so we all can see. All righty. So the question is, is this the Hummer deduction? Yeah, so <laughs> what happened when Congress put out the rules stating that anything under 6,000 pounds gross vehicle weight is a passenger automobile, naturally, people being clever, interest skyrocketed for vehicles that were over 6,000 pounds. So I believe there were there were Escalades that exceeded the 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight and the Hummer certainly would qualify for that. And even just with those two vehicles, what are you noticing? They're essentially luxury vehicles, right? So all of a sudden, Congress, by trying to be very clever and targeting the passenger vehicles, created the luxury SUV loophole, all right? And if you Google luxury SUV loophole, what ended up happening was that billionaires use this loophole to get trucks and SUVs deducted, all right? And look at this. This tax law is nicknamed the Hummer loophole, all right? This is a prime example of how trying to affect social engineering through income taxes can A, work, and B, backfire, right? So... Catherine, very good question, very astute observation. That is the Hummer loophole or provision, whatever you want to call it. But it did lead to taxpayers calling their CPAs frantically and saying, hey, I want to buy a vehicle over 6,000 uh, 6, pounds. Should I get this one? Should I get that one? And all of the cars that they mentioned just happened to be luxury vehicles. You know, a Toyota Camry doesn't exceed 6,000 pounds. It's just the reality of it. So little bit of insight on depreciation it's a beautiful thing we've got some comments coming in 
All right, Hamish, I see your question. You're very welcome for answering your question. I appreciate you watching. All right. So I believe the Honda Odyssey counts for the 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight deduction as well. All right, let's 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 actually check that out, okay? Because you guys are listening to all this. And the question is, how do we even check whether a vehicle qualifies? Let's have a depreciation adventure, all right? So Honda Odyssey, all right, let's say the 2021, because you have to be careful with regard to the year as well, right? Because they can change over time. So you go 2021 Honda Odyssey, gross vehicle weight, all right? And good old Google should be able to tell us what that is. All right, so we have the specs over here. Let's see if we have the gross vehicle weight. Okay, this is harder than I thought. But essentially, if you look it up and you're able to find what the weight is. Okay, so here we go. So exterior measurements, we have the curb weight, which is not exactly the number we're looking for, but it could be close. Now, what I'm seeing here is for all these different trims, you have to also keep the trim in mind. We're not quite getting to 6,000 here. All right, so unless there's a different version of this vehicle, or the gross vehicle weight is that much different from the curb weight. I would imagine they're fairly close together. I don't think the Honda Odyssey makes it for 2021 under this trim, but I would generally research it a bit further. But that's how you look it up. You just simply Google the year, the type of vehicle, gross vehicle weight. You should be able to track it down pretty readily. All right. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Again, any brave souls who want to call in, the number is right on the screen. I don't bite. Let's have a conversation so this stream is not just me pontificating endlessly. All right. Again, appreciate you guys watching. Drop a like, drop some comments in the video, and we will keep on trucking. All right. Now that we've beaten up that question pretty well, let's move on. All righty. So this next question has to do with taxes. Surprise, surprise. All right, tax write-offs for a freelancer. Let's jump in. I'm a freelance lighting designer for theater and dance. I travel a lot for work and additionally see a lot of performances in order to stay up to date with what's going on in the industry. A few questions. Can I write off tickets to performances, theater, dance, concerts, etc.? It's extremely useful for me to see what other people are doing in the industry. When traveling, how much of my meals can I write off? Usually, I'm housed by a theater, but I pay for my own meals. Can I write these off? Fair question. If I get a drink with someone to discuss the industry, can I write this off? All right. All very astute, beautiful questions. Now, what we're getting into here is the fact that Congress really hates, they hate a few things, all right, but they, they hate double taxation and they really hate when personal expenses are deducted, all right? They want to do everything in their power to make sure that if you enjoy or love something that you definitely don't get a tax deduction. That's an exaggeration, but in essence, when individuals are attorneys or doctors, the line between personal and business tends to be clearer, right? Because the cotton swabs at the doctor's office, the tongue depressor, all those <laughs> medicines that they have, uh, the chair that they use for patients to sit on, most likely they're not using that for personal purposes unless they have a weird side hobby or they have an OnlyFans account or some, something like that. In general, that's business, all right? So when a doctor tells me that they purchased an MRI machine for $3.2 million, I can clearly see that that's a business expense, all right? Nobody's having fun in their MRI, MRI machine saying, hey, guys, come over, grab, grab an MRI <laughs> at their party, right? So in that case, it's very clear. On the other hand, you have a situation where in the entertainment business, the line between personal expenses and business expenses tends to be a lot more fuzzy, okay? And the issue there is that individuals, and I'm not taking away that they're in business, that they have to hustle, that it's difficult. I'm not taking any of that away. Believe me, I was a musician most of my life. I feel you. But the thing is that to separate personal and business, 
becomes more difficult and you have to be careful because again if you are liberal in this area and you start taking all sorts of deductions you get that letter in the mail from the taxing authority says hey we don't agree provide substantiation and tell us why these are deductible business expenses and then again you're guilty until proven innocent you have to back up your claim and that's not a great position to be in because in some cases it can be an uphill battle so let's go back to the question now someone who is in the entertainment business right they're an actor an actress a writer uh, photographer videographer all these different things i can understand when they make the case that hey i watch movies to see what the latest trends are to see what the latest techniques are to make sure that my game is at its highest because it's a way of continuing education you have to keep sharpening the tools in your toolbox and what better way than to see what everyone is doing make sure that you're current and up to whatever trends may be applicable but there's the other side in that hey well you probably would have seen that movie anyway right even if you weren't in the business it's just a fun movie to see or you might have gone to that show anyhow for personal purposes but you all just happen to do it for business purposes so how do we separate it out and in so many situations we've had actors and actresses and these types of clients that provide a tremendous list of expenditures I hesitate to call them expenses just yet, but their DVD purchases, Netflix account, Apple Music, all of these concerts that they went to, conventions, if they're in a particular field, you know, the, you have people who do attend Dungeons and Dragons conventions, all these different things, right? And you have to look at it from an objective income tax perspective. And sometimes you have to make some real decisions because you have to know where to draw the line all right so let's tackle this all right can i write off tickets to performances theater dance and concerts now again what we're trying to look for is the line between personal and business and how do we make the case that one of these expenses is indeed a business write-off as opposed to just something you did for fun well just so happens that our friends at the irs I love the IRS. They get more hate than they deserve. Published an entertainment audit technique guide. Now, what is this? They're basically showing you their cards and saying, look, this is how we're going to address these matters. And essentially, we get to see their playbook. So let's take a look. All right. If we go to page 38, and I'm going to drop the link to this down below for you guys. All righty. So you guys can see what i'm talking about all right and while i'm looking this up feel free to drop a like on the video all right so i'm going to drop this link in the live chat just so you guys can see what i'm looking at okay so on page 38 we get to personal expense issues all right this is not the first time this has been covered this is a well-worn area of tax law all right so keeping current let's read Entertainers have been known to make a convincing argument about how much they have to spend to stay on top. You notice how that's in quotes? Oh, they're, uh, they're a stern bunch, those IRS people. Or keep current, nevertheless. Most of the items typically overlap too much with personal expenses to constitute business deductions. Well, typically. It says typically. But let's see how to get around that. Cable television. This is a popular deduction that we see. And the question is, if you're an entertainer, is that a business expense or is it personal or is it a little of both? Let's find out. Taxpayers in the entertainment industry often try to deduct amounts paid for cable television. They must be able to show, this is the key, how cable television as a whole specifically benefits their employment. Section 274, don't worry about that, places strict limits on deductions for items which are generally considered to constitute amusement, entertainment, or recreation. Such items are thus deductible only when there is a clear tie to particular work. These are all key words here. You got you to gotta really read into this. This is concentrated, but it's very powerful stuff. 
Now, cable TV may also be deducted as an educational or research tool. To qualify as an educational tool, it must directly benefit the taxpayer's trade or business. Now, here is the greatest key of all of this. If you get nothing out of this question, understand this. This must be shown through written documentation. Okay? That's the key. All right. So if you're an actor, if you're an entertainer, videographer, camera person, whatever, and you want to make the case for tax purposes that your cable television expenses are deductible as opposed to being a personal expense, then write it down. Write down an analysis of this show, of that show. Write down the observations that you made as a professional reviewing what you're watching and include that in your file. Just file it away. All right, you don't have to include it with your tax return, but it's there if and when it's questioned. And in that case, that's crucial to have on hand because otherwise the case can be made that you didn't really get benefit out of that cable television. It was just for your entertainment and your kids' entertainment and your spouse's entertainment. And there's no business purpose to that expenditure. So it may be disallowed. And what happens then is you get nailed for the extra taxes, penalties, interest, and you get to pay someone like me to fix the situation for you and it ain't cheap so to be on the right side of this have written documentation because it's hard to contest if you're the irs agent you're only going to get so far if someone hits you with that written documentation Ooh, i love it when my clients have that documentation because everyone sleeps well at night all right so in addition to the record keeping requirements of IRC 274, don't worry about that. There should be some note taking activity showing exactly what educational benefit was achieved. This may take any form that is reasonable for a particular event. Now understand, they don't need you to write a 17 page dissertation on the latest episode of Game of Thrones. OK, <laughs> they just need you to have some basic note taking there's no word limit or anything like that but it has to be reasonable all right so just jot some things down make sure it's applicable to your business and you should be good the easiest way to trace the expense to a particular event or class the better the chances of an allowable deduction all right again you don't want to get sideways with this because if you're in the entertainment business most if not all of your deductions may have that personal element built in and the IRS will nail you. And don't forget the state taxing authorities. They'll nail you if you don't have your documentation on point. Let's move on. Oh, let's not forget. If the taxpayer has a spouse or children in the household, their personal use of cable television should also be considered in determining any allowable deduction. Okay, so even if you take all of those detailed notes and you wrote out why what you're watching is helpful for your business, if you have a spouse and two kids that the case can be made that only 25% of the cable TV expenses are deductible for business purposes because you nailed the deduction in terms of your documentation, but there are other people in the household. You see how petty this can get? And we'll look at some examples of some tax court cases and how they played out so you can see specifically how this can play out in real life. All right, stay with me here. Movies and theater. Okay, so we talked about cable television. Let's move on to movies and theater. And again, this is a well-worn area, so much so that there's an audit guide that's been published, all right? So it's tough to win in this area if you're not on the right side of it to begin with, all right? I'm going to make this a little bigger for you guys. Movies and theater. The same situation exists for movies and theater. Movies and theater are deducted as entertainment and or education or research. At least this time, they didn't put quotes on it, right? <laughs> Either way, the same documentation requirements exist. The taxpayer must specifically identify how the movie or play directly applied to his or her career at the time through the appropriate documentation. Even where a deduction for a particular event is allowed, such as a theater ticket to a certain play to research an upcoming film role, only one ticket would generally be deductible. All right, so again, they're trying to nail it down just for you. If you took your family and all your friends to the screening of a movie and you paid for everything out of pocket and it's $3,000, guess what? Very small portion of that may be deductible because you're not getting a deduction for them. All right. All righty. So 
appearance and image. Here's a big one because a lot of our entertainment industry clients, they get hair, they get makeup, they get nails, they get clothes. And they ask us, well, what's deductible? Well, let's see. Taxpayers in the entertainment industry sometimes incur unusually high expenses to maintain an image. These expenses are frequently related to an individual's appearance in the form of clothing, makeup, and physical fitness. That's the other thing. Gyms are a huge expense. Other expenses in this area include bodyguards and limousines. Guys, I can't tell you how much I spend on my bodyguards and limousines. It adds up quickly. There, these are generally found to be personal expenses as the inherently personal nature of the expense and the personal benefit far outweigh any potential business benefit. So no deduction is allowed for wardrobe, general makeup, or hairstyles for auditions, job interviews, or to maintain an image, okay? Very difficult to win in this regard in making the case that you're keeping up your image and therefore it's deductible because of the inherent personal benefit that you would get out of that, okay? Now, let's hone in on wardrobe. To deduct clothes as a business expense, the following three requirements must be met, all three. The clothes must be required by the employer, or if you're self-employed in this case, whatever your job happens to be. Two, the clothes must be suitable, uh, the clothes must not be suitable for general or personal wear. That's very important. So that means that if you can wear this outside in public and not have the police called on you, then it's probably not deductible. It's probably personal. And three, the clothes must not be worn for general or personal wear. So they must not be suitable for general or personal wear, and they must not be worn for general or personal wear. And this is from a tax court case. Whenever you see this something v commissioner that's a tax court case and you can look these up they're very detailed and get into much more specificity with regard to what the tax treatment is of these matters and you can read them they're pretty interesting i mean to me i'm crazy but you might like them who knows when the production companies do not provide or pay for the wardrobe expenses for costumes and period clothing that's a certain time period relax are generally deductible However, most union contracts provide for compensation to be given to performers who require special wear, and the taxpayer must prove that his or her contract did not include such reimbursement for the expense to be allowable. You see the various angles they're going at this with? They want to make sure that you didn't receive reimbursement for those expenses, because if it's common in the industry and for some reason you don't get a reimbursement, that in and of itself may be suspicious, right? May raise questions. Don't leave any stone unturned, okay? If your records are good, then everybody sleeps well at night and you don't have problems from a tax perspective. All right, makeup. The studio usually provides makeup for performances. Stage makeup that the taxpayer pays for, buys for an audition or a live theatrical performance may be deductible if it is not general over-the-counter product. So if, if you're in cats, all right, and you have to put the whiskers on and you have to put the crazy hair on and the, 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 the makeup that you need to do that production and it's not general off-the-shelf Sephora makeup, if it's special stage makeup, then it may be deductible. Again, they want only business use. They don't want any personal. But if you go to Sephora and you pick up the eyeliner that you happen to also use for personal purposes, that's just not deductible. It's not 50-50. It's just zero in terms of deductibility. All right. So you guys can take a look at this publication. There are some additional items here in terms of what's deductible and what isn't. But let's take a look at the tax court cases because these are examples of when taxpayers actually went to fight with the taxing authority, the IRS usually in this case. And we can see here that there are a thousand, over a thousand court cases that address the non-deductibility of personal expenses, all right? I mean, if you're having trouble falling asleep at night, be sure to pull up one of these cases. And they reference a few of them, which particularly pertain to the entertainment industry, all right? So very brief descriptions here we're going to check out just to get a lay of the land, all right? So we have Tillman v. United States. So the holding was that videos, clothes, gym memberships, computers, recording equipment, haircuts, and manicures are non-deductible personal expenses. Whoa, pretty serious. Aside from that, we have Oliver V. Commissioner. Again, you could Google any of these, look them up and read them. Television and newspapers in that case. 
uh, I'm guessing was not deductible, right? So generally taxpayers will say, well, I have to keep track of current trends and new things that may be happening in the industry. So I have to buy newspapers and I have to watch television. Well, depending on the facts and circumstances, you may not make it over the hurdle. Richards v. Commissioner, holding is that research trips, televisions, television, videotapes, magazines, audio equipment were non-deductible personal expenses. Again, you can read one or more of these cases and get into the details, but that was the holding. That was the finding when all was said and done. Crow v. Commissioner, holding that expenses of the mother of a child actor were inherently personal and non-deductible personal expenses, and that private school expenses for the child actor were also not deductible. So you can guess that this mother said, hey, my kid is a child actor. He needs to have the highest education to maintain his performance. Well, the IRS disagrees. They say it's personal, not deductible. Now, this one's interesting. Sparkman v. Commissioner. I like that name. Holding was that where the taxpayer, who was a motion picture actor and radio performer, purchased two sets of artificial upper teeth in order to eliminate a hiss which had developed in his speech and to restore the taxpayer to perfect enunciation which was necessary in his profession. All right, so think about that. This person was an actor. They had to enunciate correctly and clearly, and they purchased an artificial set of upper teeth, okay? So you'd think that that is clearly deductible, no doubt about it, home run. Well, the taxpayer did not prove that the teeth were to be used for business purposes only. That's harsh. This guy has teeth to pronounce words correctly. He's an actor and the IRS said, ah, not deductible. The amount paid for teeth was not an expense occurred in carrying on a trade or business, but was a personal expense. And no part thereof was deductible computing for taxation purposes, the taxpayer's net income. Whoa, that's kind of extreme. Even from my perspective, I would think that maybe some portion of the expenses would be deductible. But as you could see, tax court said, well, in this case, the IRS and tax court both disagreed and said, nope personal expense but interestingly it says the taxpayer did not prove that the teeth were to be used for business purposes only so <coughs> excuse me that may be the weakness in the case in that they did not provide adequate substantiation or they didn't make the case correctly that it would be used for business purposes i think i haven't read the case but there might be a way for at least some portion of those expenses to be deductible but again this is a case from 1940 so it's not all that recent but still could be precedential, meaning it could be used as precedent. All right, Westerman v. Commissioner holding was that the taxpayer was not entitled to deduct some studio time, automobile, travel, or meals and entertainment expenses, but was entitled to deduct guitar repair, practice, studio, and disc expenses. All right, so you can see some granularity here, okay? So sometimes they can't deduct it, sometimes they can't. And you'd be surprised in some cases which way it goes. That's why we as tax professionals have to look at court cases and examine them to then apply the information that we get to our client situation, right? You're not going to find this reading some IRS publication or even the tax code. This is where you got to get into the details, the nitty gritty, and work out how these situations can play out. All right. And finally, we have Heinz v. Commissioner. Holding was that the taxpayer, a staff announcer and television news writer, could not deduct expenses of wardrobe, laundry, or dry cleaning, which were not significantly different from those of other business people limited to conservative styles and fashions, even though he was required to maintain, quote, physical appearance suitable for services as a television announcer, but was not reimbursed for the expenses. Okay, so more than a thousand cases in which taxpayers were fighting with the irs over what's personal what's business be on the right side maintain records and if you're in the entertainment business and you want to deduct expenses make life easy take some notes make sure you have written documentation to substantiate your expenses and then you should be in the clear it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get the deduction but you'll be fighting from an uphill position as opposed to trying to win an uphill battle. And that's a position I want to be in every time. All right. So let's go back to the question. Now, can I write off tickets to performances, theater, dance, and concerts? 
take notes. If you take adequate notes, most likely you will be able to deduct the expenses, assuming they have a clear link to your business. Now, when traveling, how much of my meals can I write off? I'm usually housed by a theater, but I pay for my own meal. So meal deduction can get hairy in its own right. There's a whole bunch of tax law that has to do with just the deduction of meals. But generally, you do get a 50% deduction. So assuming it's a travel meal, it may be 50% deductible. But we need to get into a bit more detail on that. And if I get a drink with someone to discuss the industry, can I write this off? No. <laughs> right? So meals are deductible. Congress does not want to reward people for going to the bar and getting wasted and then wrapping their car around the telephone pole potentially. So alcohol should be deducted from the meals expense before you apply it to that 50% limitation. Okay. So often we'll get everything lumped in for our clients and we say, look, what percentage of these $5,000 in business meals are alcohol, right? And they'll say, oh, well, probably 20%. Okay, so we take out 20%, we use the rest as the deduction, we take the 50% of that, and that's how you get the meals deduction for income tax purposes. All right, so if this is helpful for you guys, if you guys get value out of it, drop a like for the video, just gently pet the like button. Okay, subscribe to the channel, definitely, because there's going to be a lot more quality content coming. And I guarantee you, we're just going to take it up several notches because that's how I do it. All right. So we have some questions here. Let's see if we can get through these real quick and then we'll wrap it up on that note. So let's just make sure we don't uh, put in some crazy information here. All right. And then we'll get this all up on the screen for you guys. Okay. So we have a question from Amber. I own a home and use one of the rooms as my home office. I recently had to update electrical and painted this room. Can I write off the expenses for painting and electrical work in the room? All right. Well, the topic of the home office deduction can be the topic of a whole different video in and of itself. But essentially... There's two ways to calculate the deduction for the home office, all right? And let's say you have a dwelling which has a particular square footage, whatever this happens to be, and let's say you use a portion of that for business, all right? So you have this business portion, it's used exclusively and regularly for business. It means you don't have any personal activity in here, so it's a separate room that when you're not conducting business activity, the door's closed, the lights are off, nobody is using it. Assuming that's the case, if you make a repair or improvement to the property overall, then you would take a percentage as a deduction for this business use area. So let's just come up with a number here. So total improvement. All right. All right, let's say it was $10,000. This was to the overall property. And let's say the business use percentage, okay, was, let's say, 15%, okay? So in this case, we simply would multiply these two numbers, and this would be the potential deduction, being 1,500. Let me get this over here so you guys could see. So essentially, when you have this business use, let's say it's 15%, you then are eligible for the deduction of 1,500 in this case, assuming it's a deductible expense. So any sort of uh, improvement that you could write off in a particular year so generally a repair or even a lot of improvements to the property such as adding solar panels things like that can potentially allow you to allocate a portion of it to the home office now on the other hand you may improve just this area so if you're just improving the room itself so if you updated the electrical just in the room and you had the room painted then let's say the total improvement was 5,000. In that case, if it's just for the room itself, then you do not have to allocate it, okay? So essentially you get the full 5,000 as the deduction in that case, all right? Now again, there's 
there are some stipulations in terms of what's currently deductible with bonus depreciation versus what you have to take over time but what i'm saying is if you have an improvement that benefits the overall property then you allocate using the business use percentage if you have an improvement again assuming this is all deductible that's a separate question just for the space itself you get to deduct the whole thing and it makes sense it's kind of logical if you think about it all right now so Hale said you inspired me to pursue accounting big respect big respect to you my friend thank you so much for watching all right I thought entertainment expenses were not deductible well that's why this live stream is here to spread the good information and knowledge all right and being in LA you must see quite a few clients in the entertainment business quite a few that is correct but I love them they're all great and with a little bit of guidance they become amazing beautiful clients all right and with that if you guys are watching i see the concurrent viewer high count is higher than it's ever been thank you guys so much i appreciate it hit that like button subscribe to the channel if you're still hanging out drop a comment i love reading your comments certainly subscribe to the channel it's free and you're gonna get notified of future content as soon as it becomes available and with that thank you guys for all the comments and the questions I'll see you guys next time. Efros Financial Power Hour. Mark your calendar. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. And as always, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks for watching.